Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, great. So now we have our final talk of the day uh, from Wim Van Dam, and he's going to tell us about quantum polynomial interpolation. Okay, thanks for the uh, opportunity. Um, this is the first time that I'm going to give a talk about this uh, topic, so uh, I'm still like very enthusiastic about it, but that also, of course, means that I want to talk about every detail, you know, because it's all so fresh. So, uh, but on the other hand, I've got a plane to catch, so it will be impossible for me to run over time. But um, yeah, I apologize for like the abundance of math. It's just that uh, yeah, I, I couldn't uh, couldn't help myself. Um, it's a decidedly lowbrow problem that I'm attacking here. Um, polynomial interpolation in polynomials in one variable. And of course, you know, if you if I'm facing a uh, an unknown quadratic polynomial, then I know after I've evaluated this polynomial on three points, I know what the three coefficients are of this polynomial. So this, you know, holds for reals. This holds for uh, coefficients, you know, that are uh, maybe finite field elements. This holds in general. So that's, you know, how you do it. You, if you have a degree D polynomial that you do not know and you access it in kind of in a black box query model, you need, uh, when you do D plus one evaluations, then you know your polynomial. And that kind of makes sense because you need to know D plus one coefficient, so you ask, d plus one times for information, and then uh, you know it. And so this works, and this works, you can do this efficiently, and uh, it works without error. Okay. So that's the classical what you can do. And then classically what you cannot do, and as always then crypto people think that that's a good thing, is uh, doing it with less than d plus one queries. If I have a degree d polynomial and I only know uh, d uh, sites, uh, d values, of uh, this polynomial, well then obviously I know a little bit about the polynomial because I know d values. But if somebody asks me like, well, what about a next point, like a d plus one point on this polynomial, then um, I don't know anything. So it's kind of like a zero uh, knowledge kind of uh, knowledge that you get from this polynomial that you know the, the values fx1 through fxd that you queried, but you don't know anything else about the polynomial. And you can make this uh, precise. You say, um, so this all gets kind of complicated when you deal about the reals, of course, because if I have a point here and I've got a point nearby, then I kind of expect the polynomial to be kind of like in between, you know, that it's a straight line, unless the coefficients can be very wild. And then, you know, you need to have a, uh, you kind of like, well, what do you, what assumption do you uh, have about what these coefficients uh, of this polynomial are? So the goal gets very messy. So what we do instead is we assume from now on that the coefficients are of a, a finite field of size q, but I will use p because that's easier on the notation. And um, so now, you know, there are each coefficients, there are q, uh, sorry, there are p possibilities. Um, I can just take random, uh, completely uniformly random uh, coefficients. That's my assumption. And then, you know, uh, I've, uh, you, can, you can quite easily show that if I only have d classical queries, that if I want to guess uh, the function value on a value input value that I did not evaluate, that my, uh, all I can do is guess and I will be correct one over p times. So it's completely, and this is a technical term, this is useless, like useless d queries are useless in interpolating a, classical, uh, a polynomial in a classical manner. So, and that, that, that is a good thing because that kind of is the basis of uh, Shamir's uh, secret uh, sharing protocol where you need d plus one people to get together to figure out the shared secret, which is the polynomial. If you have only d people that get together, then they cannot like unravel what the uh, uh, discover what this uh, polynomial is. So this is, um, this is uh, uh, known, this is tight, useless with d queries, perfect with d plus one classical queries, and uh, yeah, so we, we all know this. Okay. So this is a traditional uh, topic, and it's kind of you know, surprising to me that uh, I never thought of this before until my co-author Andrew Childs uh, mentioned it to me, that you know, well, what changes if I allow uh, 
a, uh, that I quantum query this polynomial because this polynomial is really like a black box. So, you know, uh, we can imagine that we have at our disposal, uh, uh, you know, this, this polynomial is in a, in a uh, black box and I quantum query this polynomial. What can we do uh, better? Can we do better than uh, the classical uh, d plus one uh, algorithm? So that's a natural question uh, to ask. And um, yeah, I don't know why, but there were these, so maybe people thought about this and then like did not write it up or so. Uh, uh, but, but there are some results. Um, uh, Kane and Kutin um, proved in 2009 and Meyer and Pommersheim uh, proved in 2010 that you need quantumly at least d plus one over two queries. Uh, the, the stronger result is uh, the 2010 result where it showed that quantumly, if you have d over two uh, queries, then that's useless again. That if I have d over two queries to my unknown polynomial, then I cannot do any interpolation. So I need at least d plus two, d plus one over two uh, queries. And you know, you just have to, whenever you see d over two, you just have to assume that d is even. And when you see d plus one over two, you just have to assume that d is odd. And you know, that's kind of a, uh, it's not interesting uh, to talk about that. Um, Kane and Kutin conjectured in 2009 that actually uh, there would be no uh, quantum advantage, that d plus one quantum queries were needed. Um, this was disproven by Bonnet and Zendry in 2012, where they showed that there is a uh, D quantum query algorithm that does the job. It doesn't do it perfectly, but it has a success probability of one uh, minus something that um, uh, gets uh, smaller and smaller and smaller as uh, uh, P grows. P is the size of the finite field and D is the degree of the polynomial. And so specifically, um, what they, to summarize what they do is they kind of uh, uh, figure out that one query is sufficient for, you know, uh, a linear expression. So then you've got like two coefficients for the price of one query, and then, you know, the remaining uh, coefficients you just kind of like do kind of like the way you would do it classically. So that, that's kind of how, uh, how Bonnet and uh, Zendry uh, do their stuff. So there is a quantum advantage, but it's like if ever there was a minute advantage, uh, this would be it. Um, that uh, you can uh, you can do better quantumly. So that that's, that was like the state of the art um, until uh, our result that says that actually uh, d plus one over two uh, quantum queries is sufficient to uh, find uh, an interpolation uh, of a polynomial. Um, our success probability is constant. It's a constant uh, success probability. So we're not doing it perfectly. We're not doing it with a probability uh, that is you know, close to one, but it's a constant success probability. So I have to, yes, exactly, 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 exactly. No, so, so what's, what, what's the model here? Well, I fix my degree D and then I let my finite field uh, uh, size grow. Because like, why don't you do it the other way around? Well, I don't want to, um, but also that, <laughs> Um, if your field would be like really small and you would have a big degree, well, you know, modulo two x squares equals x, modulo three. So, you know, high degree polynomials only make sense if the finite field is big enough. And so in that sense, um, what you do is uh, you fix the degree and then you let um, uh, P uh, grow. That, that's kind of the, the model. And so this omega one, um, is as uh, p grows, but it, it levels out at a constant. Specifically, as you're in the limit of large enough p, uh, the success probability goes over, and this is not because I'm very excited, but this is because it's one over k factorial, where k is the number of queries. So, so, so from now on, k is the number of queries, and k is d plus one over, uh, over two. So it, the success probability, um, goes down pretty badly as a function of the degree. But for a fixed degree, it's a constant. So that, that's, that's, that's the, uh, that's the uh, uh, setting. Um, so that's the query setting. And then as an aside, um, the space-time complexity of this algorithm is polynomial. It's like efficient. It's polynomial in the logarithm of uh, uh, p. So that's all you know, the best you can hope for. Um, 
Can you do better than d plus one over two queries? No, because of the results of the previous slide. That d over two queries gives us a useless uh, quantum uh, setting. Um, can you do better than this one over k factorial uh, success probability? I don't think so, but we don't have a proof of that. So there, there are like reasons why that one over k factorial actually comes up quite naturally. And so um, this might be uh, 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 the best you can do with d plus one over two uh, queries. So that's so that's 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 our uh, that's our result. So um, it we reduce the. Um, uh, but I mean, when you think of it in a crypto set setting, you know, Shamir's uh, secret sharing, then you know a constant success probability is not like that's like a bad thing. So. Uh, 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 it's definitely kind of a significant to, to have a constant success uh, probability. And uh, yeah, so we've got a, a query reduction um, by a factor of two. And uh, I think this is the hardest factor of two improvement that I've ever worked on um, in, uh, uh, since I've been working on uh, uh, quantum algorithms. Okay. So how does our algorithm, yes, sure. So what, what's the sample space over which that probability is taken? Is it the space of problems, the space of runs of the argument? Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yes. So this success probability, uh, these probabilities come completely from quantum mechanics. So for each instance, so it's the I same probability. Yeah, but but um, we're in the business. Yeah. Then the number of queries then became uh, k times k factorial. So that's not particularly I know. good. Yeah, I know. yeah. Better than nothing. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. Well, okay. it's just, <laughs> it's worse than uh, the, the classical approach. Yes. Yeah, so, so these probabilities are because of quantum mechanics. Yeah, and uh, it's independent of the instance of the polynomial that you try to solve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So our algorithm uh, works as follows. It has these uh, uh, five steps, uh, four of which are trivial. Um, you, so k is the number of queries, and k is then d plus one over two. Um, you create a superposition over k registers. This is the input. Then you evaluate the, uh, the polynomial uh, k times. So our queries are not adaptive or anything. We just like do it. You could, almost, you could do it in parallel. Uh, then we do a Fourier transform because you always do a Fourier transform sometime. Um, and then, then the magic happens. We do some elaborate computations modulo uh, our finite field. And then we do another Fourier transform and we measure, and then with the success probability of one over k factorial, uh, we measure the coefficients of the uh, polynomial f that we are looking at. Um, this algorithm is inspired by the uh, pretty good measurement approach to the hidden subgroup problem. So that, that field is uh, bearing fruit now. Um, and uh, the magic happens in step four. That's where the hard analysis um, uh, takes place. And um, for some of you who know some older results that may sound somewhat similar, um, we do not use quantum oracle interrogation. That's in a different setting where you query a, um, a binary uh, black box and you get a speed up of uh, almost um, uh, two, an improvement uh, of uh, two. And that, that's not what we're doing. We're doing something quite different from, uh, we also, we are not doing um, uh, kind of an adaptation of uh, parity querying. Like all the, uh, it's not the factor two improvements that you've seen before. It's something, it's something different that we're doing. All right. So, um, right. So let's do the first three steps um, uh, just, just to kind of get started. Um, we create a uniform superposition over the input uh, registers. We query the function uh, k times. So now we're in this um, um, superposition. And then we do a Fourier transform. Well, we do k of them. k Fourier transforms just over uh, these k registers. And so now what we have is a superposition over, uniform superpositions over x values and y values. And all the information are, uh, all the information about the function is now in the coefficients, in, in the amplitudes of this superposition. So that, that's what the sitting is. Okay. Now, some of you who have uh, dealt with, you know, phase and phase estimation um, say like, well, why don't you use the kick phase kickback trick, right? Where you kind of, um, you don't use this second register. Um, that 
won't work because um, notice we need uh, 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 d plus one. At the end, we need to have d plus one uh, coefficients. And so we need to read out d plus one registers. And only if you know k plus k um, equals d plus one do we have enough space to have the coefficients stored. So it is crucial that indeed you write out the, uh, the function values here and then do the Fourier transform because you need 2k registers have to be involved to be able to even store the coefficients uh, at the end of the day. So uh, yeah, okay. So these are all the um, the the, uh, the the trivial. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like it's obvious. Well, it's not obvious, but I mean, makes sense if you've seen a few quantum algorithms that this might work. And so, uh, so where are we? <clears throat> We're here, and because I need my uh, uh, letter i for an index, I'm going to rewrite e to the two pi i um, just as uh, psi. And so the state that we ended up with on the previous slide is um, uh, that state, that uh, that state, uh, the, bottom, the top top right, a superposition over x and y's that are registers uh, uh, of length k each, so two k in total. Um, then you know a phase that is determined by the polynomial on the uh, the polynomial values of x times um, uh, y. And like, let's let let's get the coefficients that we need to uh, that we want. Let's get them out of let let's get them out in the clear. Let's rewrite this, you know, using the fact that f is indeed this polynomial with coefficients um, uh, c i, and um, so we're having this state: uniform superpositions over x and y's, phases where you know you've got a sum over the coefficients that we need, and then um, polynomial expressions where the y's come in as linear terms and the x values come in as um, uh, exponentials. As in like, you've got like x and x squared all the way up to uh, x to the power d. This is, you know, this is the algebra, this is how it works out. Okay. So this is what we have. And, um, uh, you know, well, is this good? Is this useful? Well, it would be useful if it would be just a little bit different. If, you know, um, I told you that in the end we're going to do a Fourier transform and then we're going to measure uh, the registers and that's going to be the coefficients, we hope. We, and that will be the coefficients with a certain success probability. Now when is it that, you know, if you had to apply a Fourier transform k times and um, then you end up with the, uh, sorry, if you apply the Fourier transform uh, uh, d plus one times, so two k times on all the registers and then you have the coefficients, when do you, you know, end up with all the coefficients? Well. That works if you are dealing with uh, this state. So if we have this state, we're perfect. Because now just a bunch of Fourier transforms will give me the coefficients. But we don't have this state. We have that state, but they're not all that different. Remember that um, uh, k equals uh, d plus one uh, over two, so this is all good. Um, the only thing, and so, you know, a summation over coefficients ci, that's also there. The only thing that is kind of um, uh, stand between us and uh, perfection is that, you know, if only these terms here, these summations, were some kind of, you know, values zi, and that then those values zi would be written uh, there. So, so I hope I kind of make my point that this, if I write that as ci's, and then if I would have in those registers those zi values uh, also, then I would be, uh, then um, things would be perfect, and I find my coefficients uh, uh, deterministically. But we're not there, so some magic needs to happen to go from this state to this ideal uh, state over here. That's 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 what we want. Okay. Um, I know that you know I'm going a little bit fast, but. At some point, I kind of reach like an intermediate stage where I can say like, well, even if you didn't follow the details, um, this is where it's at. Okay. So what do we want? Well, so we want to go from those x and y expression to the z expression. That's what we want to do. And let's pretend for, let's just define zi to be those values. So it, what it means that, you know, given the x and the y values, I want to make these zi values. So 
what I want, what this magic step is going to be, this step four in my, uh, uh, in my algorithm, is you know, starting with these x values that I end up with these z values. That, that would be like the ideal scenario if I could do that, where these zi's are these expressions. Now, obviously, given x and y, I can figure out what these zi's, I can just get you know, x, y, and z. So then the only thing um, that I need to do is uncompute the x, y from uh, uh, x, y, and z. So what I need to do is uh, figuring out what the z values are is, triv is trivial. Um, what I need to do is, uh, given the z values, can I figure out the x and y values that led to those z values such that, so that I can uncompute the x and the y's and then um, I, I would be in good shape. Now, we won't be able to do this step perfectly because it's not unitary. It turns out that you know, um, uh, several different x's and y's lead to the same value z, so it's not a unitary transformation. So that's kind of um, uh, why we do not have a deterministic algorithm. But what we can do is we can, it, we can do it pretty well. We can like approximate this behavior. And um, also another uh, observation to make is that uh, this, this crucial step that is missing is independent of the polynomial that we're trying to uh, discover. And so, um, this is why you know, the success probability is independent of the polynomial f that we try to discover. And so if I can get this working some like as unitary, if I can implement this you know, approximately that works for almost all x's and y's and almost c's, then I'm good. So it becomes kind of an average case problem that you need, an average problem that you, a problem that you need to be able to solve like on average. And so that's, that's kind of uh, nice because that means that, you know, if you come up with like very obnoxious z values, you just like, you count them if they're not too, too many, you just like ignore them. Um, so we just need to solve this uh, problem on average. Okay. So that's, 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 what the, uh, that's what the problem is. Um, so the problem is, again, um, given x, y, and z, find a way to get rid of x and y. And we're going to do that by like, given z, compute x and y. So like, um, uh, the hard part is, as it were, going from the right to the left, oddly enough. That's, that's how uncomputing uh, uh, goes. Okay. So, so what, what goes in the analysis of how you can do this? Um, so that, that took a while uh, to, to kind of figure out. The crucial, and so we're dealing now with a problem that is purely classical in its formulation, like giving a bunch of uh, value z, figure out which x's and y's, um, uh, are responsible for these uh, z values. So it's a classical problem, and in the end, the algorithm that we will use to solve this is going to be a traditional classical problem. So all the like all the quantumness uh, has already happened. And that was actually you know uniform superposition, Fourier transform, Fourier transform. That's it. So the quantum part of this algorithm is uh, is uh, is not very very big, but of course you need to do this uh, uh, computation in Superposition, so you know it is a quantum algorithm. Okay. So, what is crucial in figuring out uh, to which extent we're going to be able to approximate that uh, that magic uh, s uh, step four um, will depend upon uh, how many solutions there are for a given z. And so, in the analysis, uh, uh, what 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 matters is that um, you know, given these values z z zero through z d. Um, how many solutions x and y are there um, that have, you know, that lead to those z? And we call this eta z. That's the number of solutions um, uh, 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 for a given uh, z. Now, if eta z would always be one, then, you know, we're talking about a bijection between x and y and z, and we could do it perfectly, but that's not the case. Um, the success probability of our algorithm uh, is going to be, um, this, this expression. Well, actually, the square root of the success is going to be um, this expression. This is something that you know, we did before uh, when we were doing a, a hidden subgroup problem, uh, uh, when we were dealing with hidden subgroup uh, problems. And so um, now remember that d plus 1 equals um, 2k. And so this kind of makes sense. It, it says that, well, you know, um, there are p to the power 2k uh, 
x and y values. So that's, that's the total number. So if I add all my numbers of solutions, I should get p to the power uh, 2k. Um, if I add all the edas, I should get p to the power 2k. Uh, the number of z registers that I have to deal with is also p to the power 2k because uh, d plus 1 equals uh, 2k. So if there was no square root here, this would add up to p to the power 2k, and this success probability, the square root, would be exactly 1. And so this is you know, the kind of what, what I alluded to, that if all these, if all, if this was like a function that always had like exactly one solution, x, y, for a given z, then the success probability um, would be uh, one. But that's not that's not the case. Instead, what we prove is that um, the typical case, so ignoring you know aberrations of uh, like odd, uh, very peculiar uh, z uh, cases, the typical case is that an eta the number of solutions is either zero, in other words, you know, given a z, um, there is no x and y pair that produces that uh, z, or if there is a solution, then there are like k factorial solutions. And so what this means is that you know, uh, this summation uh, you know, introduces uh, the square root of uh, k factorial, and then you, know, you do the math, and then it uh, uh, turns out that you know, your success probability is going to be 1 over uh, k factorial. And so, um, uh, again, the number of solutions ideally would be completely uniform. But instead, what we prove is that um, it's like uh, uniform, uh, the number of solutions, or k factorial solutions, and, um, uh, or, or there are no solutions. That those are the typical cases. That, that's what we needed to prove, and that's what we, um, that's what we, um, that's what we prove. Um, the proof itself was kind of uh, fun to do, and so this is this is the the, the problem that we're uh, solving. Just what's in the uh, in the box there? It's that you're given d moments. Oh, sorry, that should be d plus one moments. You're given d plus one moments z zero through uh, z d, and you're you're asked to find uh, y values and x values over the finite field such that the equation on the right holds for all these z e values. So that's the problem that you try to solve. Like, given a z, does there exist a solution? If so, how many are them? Um, do you understand what they are? That's what you try to solve. Um, this is a moment problem that uh, some of you with a physics uh, background might be familiar with, that you know, just think of um, uh, a distribution over the real line. And you're given moments of this distribution. So the uh, the distribution is uh, mu, and you know the moments are x to the power n. So, given a bunch of moments over the real line, find out uh, if there is a distribution mu that has these moments, or prove that it is not possible, or prove that there are more than one distribution. This is a traditional problem, and then depending upon if the real line goes, to, you know, you take the whole real line, or you take like half the real line, or you take the interval between zero and one. This is called the hamburger, or the Stilches, or the third person whose name I forgot, a uh, moment um, uh, problem. So this is a problem that is well studied, and it's not trivial to solve, um, but we kind of know how to do it. And so what we, what we did was that, well, you know, you steal results. Uh, we looked at, you know, how is the moment problem done over the real line? Uh, what are useful ingredients that apply in our case where we're dealing with the finite field uh, moment problem? And so in our finite field moment problem, Rather than this distribution mu, we have the values y. So the y values are like a distribution over the, uh, over the x values. And so you look at the powers of x as the different moments. And so fortunately, some techniques of the traditional moment problem were useful. We could like employ them. And then Andrew Childs always enjoys doing that. He, founds, like, an, he finds like a reference from uh, the 18th century. Um, where uh, that was useful for us. It's called Prony's method, which is something that in signal processing is, uh, is uh, still used. And um, there, using this, this like set of techniques, we did indeed prove what I said earlier, that you know, um, typically, uh, for typical Z, uh, there will either be no solutions at all, or there will be k factorial uh, solutions. Uh, there are aberrations, but you know, they are insignificant. 
And then, so you know, where does the k factorial come? From? Where does the k factorial comes from? Well, go again to the um, uh, say that you've got a solution x and y that um, that does the job for the moments that you are given. Now, obviously, when I permute the indices j, that also gives a solution. So whenever I have a solution x and y, if I permute x and y, you know, with the same permutation which I can do in k factorial different ways, I've got again a solution. So a solution can never, never come by itself. It always comes in like blobs of k factorial solutions. What's that? Unless it is symmetric, indeed. If, you know, or, um, you know, other stuff happens, of course, that if one of the y's is zero, then x can be anything, right? Because it's, in, it, it, but indeed, or some of the x cases are, I, some of the x values are the same then you know, the permutation doesn't make it a different solution. And so uh, this is why we use an abundance of the words typical. The typical situation is that all the y's are non-zero and all the x's are different if you take your field large enough. And then you know, the k factorial kind of, kind of kicks in. That's kind of how it goes. Yeah. And so uh, that's, that's uh, I enjoyed this typographical to do this. Um, uh, uh, that, that's where the k factorial uh, comes from. And uh, so then you kind of put it all together and you get the, uh, the algorithm. And so just to remind people, and it's like, ah, I did, I did go uh, fast enough. Um, this is then you know, how, how you get this uh, result. And my, my conjecture would be that um, for d plus 1 over 2 queries, um, the success probability of 1 over k factorial is tight. I think, that, I think it's tight, but I, really I don't want to prove it. Uh, I'll leave that to other people uh, to do. That's it. Thanks. Questions for Wim? Do, do you have sense as to what each additional query gets you? Uh, Andrew and I had a long conversation how I would answer this obvious question, yes. Um, yes, I do have a sense, yes. So, is this gonna die? So, D plus one, over two queries. Is this the result that we have? We think if you go one, we no, we know, uh, we know that if you go, if you add half a query to it, that then your success probability jumps up to, uh, to one minus uh, a term that gets smaller and smaller as uh, p grows. So uh, now why did I not talk about that? Um, because we're still finishing up on the proof of that. So we, we have got it proved, we've got this result proven for some small d. We've got numerical computations that confirm that what we're seeing for small d also holds for uh, uh, arbitrary d, for, for larger uh, uh, d. And so we're kind of, we know what we need to prove to make it work, but we're still like finishing up the proof of that, yeah. So uh, yeah, if you add half a query, as it were, you, your success probability jumps to effectively one. Sure, so I got a question about your success probability. Uh, is this, uh, I, I didn't see how, whether or not your success is heralded uh, when you get it out or how the checking ends up uh, happening to see if you got a success. Is it in a form that's convenient to use amplitude amplification? Um, well, given, given that we're working on like finishing this proof, that never kind of occurred to me. I mean, what you can do is, um, if you've got a conjecture of a polynomial, you just kind of, Evaluate it at a random point and see if it works. That that's kind of you know the best I think you can do. Maybe you can do it a little bit better quantum mechanically, but that's already pretty good. So you just evaluate it on a random point and see if uh, your conjecture matches uh, what the black box is doing. Yeah. So John got away from this question by by preempting it. Do you have any idea what what the gate counts and circuit depth on, are on this yet? Uh, 
So what you've seen thus far is uh, everything but step four is pretty straightforward, right? Fourier transform, black box evaluation, so you know, whatever the complexities of that black box. The computation that we're doing in step four to make it work is uh, effectively, what's the most expensive part? Uh, matrix inversion. So however hard it is to invert a matrix of dimension uh, uh, D or D plus one, um, over, over a finite field on a quantum computer, that's like the main cost. So it's not gonna be particularly cheap, but it's not too bad. I think I saw one more. Was it? Oh, I'm sorry. Was someone else? Yeah, I mean, it really looks like parity. I mean, I know you blew that off in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> right. You no, know, I mean, and especially when you do this, and you tell me that you know one more step and it gets a lot better. It's sort of interesting. I mean, but you're not gonna. You, I, you didn't. You don't want to go there. I. I. I uh, uh, So parity goes from being useless to um, deterministic. Yeah. That's like one indication. Um, and then it's also quantum mechanically, it's the same thing. It's half the number of queries, right? Yeah, but, but quantum mechanically with parity, you go from like useless to deterministic. Yeah. Whereas we kind of are in this intermediate, like we kind of like get like success probabilities that are, you know, neither zero or, or one. Um, I, I, I really don't see, uh, I don't see the parity uh, okay. algorithm working in it. No. Yeah, no, I, no. I was yeah. just, yeah. it has the same smell, but yeah. this looks much more complicated. Uh, uh, any other, Martin, I think? I was wondering if you have any thoughts about multivariate generalizations. <laughs> I was wondering that somebody was gonna ask that question. Um, it's like an obvious question and there are some uh, results, rather recent, on multivariate uh, polynomials that are multilinear and there is some quantum advantage there. So it seems that, um, uh, yeah, no, we, that would be like the next thing to do because we already know that there are some quantum advantages for some specific systems with, uh, with multilinear uh, polynomials. And so um, that, that I expect that we can do better. What, I, what, it, what would be interesting is by going to multivariable polynomials, if maybe you know, this um, factor of two becomes like something more impressive. That would, that would be the hope. And I don't, but I don't know what to expect there. I, I don't know. Great, well let's thank Wim and all of our speakers today, thank you. <laughs>